Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Kelly Stremmel of McKenzie Worldwide. Today we're talking about secrets management. This is episode two in our series of 12. So today I'd like to introduce you to Mark Cooper, president and founder of PKI Solutions. You may know him as the PKI guy. We'll have plenty of time to answer questions at the end, so please feel free to post them um, in the Q&A tab. Now I'll turn it over to Mark. Well, thanks, Kelly. Well, we're going to start our uh, second episode of our webinar series by talking about secrets and secrets management. And frankly, it's it's an interesting area because we find customers a lot of times have this challenge in their environment, but there's not always a, a clear understanding of, of what the problem is or, or what we really mean by secrets. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we mean by secrets management, and, and we'll go over what those different types of secrets are in your environment what some of the different types of uh, data protection schemes are. And we're also going to talk about some of the things that you can begin doing today to identify and control those secrets. And there's really some strategies you can take with your vendors and even some of your partner organizations to make sure that you are the ones that are in control of your secrets. And we're also going to talk about a few of the pitfalls of, of not having good controls around secrets and data protection. In the current IT landscape, we, we see reports every day and every week about data breaches and information disclosures, whether it's a hotel chain that's had information that's inadvertently exposed, and a couple of them have even had that happen a few times now. We see it also with information that's inadvertently left in open storage um, blobs on uh, cloud providers, as well as just um, general use of information that winds up being inadvertently disclosed. So we see this general topic of secrets and, and data protection as something that's affecting every organization, whether it's from direct hacking or inadvertent mistakes of, of data that's left unprotected, or sometimes even encrypted data that's stored right along with the encryption keys itself because it was easy or someone just didn't have good hygiene when it came to those things. And we also see that a lot of organizations really don't have a clear plan when it comes to defining and tracking these secrets. A lot of focus is on, is information encrypted? Is it protected? But there isn't necessarily a good classification of what these different types of secrets and what kind of data itself is actually being protected itself. So we know that most organizations have some type of secrets management issue, and sometimes it is manifesting itself simply as a need for symmetric key encryption or public key infrastructure needs, but there isn't necessarily an overall secrets management plan in place. So let's start by talking about what a secret is, because a lot of us really come into this conversation with different ideas and different thoughts about what a secret is. And really in our context, we're gonna really say that anything that we need to keep confidential in our organization, other than the data itself, is a secret. And that can really range from anything from a password to an API token. So the secrets are really those things, those keys that are going to allow us to protect our information, to protect communications, and even protect identities. That is what we're going to be classifying as a secret. So with these secrets, it's how we're going to go about making sure that our data and identities can be processed and stored and transmitted as needed throughout our business, while at the same time making sure that we have control of those secrets. So the most common type of secret that's out there, obviously, is things like passwords. But we also have passwords that exist in many different ways and often with other types of terms. So when we think about, for instance, a Wi-Fi network and we talk about the, the, the Wi-Fi code to get onto a network, we're, we're really talking about a password. It's, it's some piece of alphanumeric information that allows someone to get onto a Wi-Fi network. Same thing with a VPN. So passwords aren't just some user that's sitting down at a computer or on their mobile device and, and trying to authenticate or get the email. We also have secrets that are encryption keys, both symmetric keys and asymmetric keys. Our symmetric keys are, are often used for almost every type of communication that we have, though a lot of times it's happening behind the scenes. So when we think about symmetric encryption keys, every TLS session has some type of symmetric encryption that is occurring. 
but these are often ephemeral types of keys that are used for a short period of time. The client and the server negotiate them and they throw them away. This is one place where you kind of get a get out of jail free card, uh, a, a ephemeral symmetric key. There isn't any kind of long term data that's protected or encrypted that we need to worry about. These keys are actually just short lived. We don't really have to worry too much about how we're managing those as an organization. Asymmetric keys, those, those underpinnings of, of private keys that are associated with certificates and identities in a PKI, that's most definitely a secret. How, how do we go about making sure that the certificates that we've issued to a server or to a, a, a user or an application is secure? And it all goes back to how these encryption keys, the, these asymmetric private keys are stored. So those should most definitely be in our definition of a secret. We also see uh, secret items, including things around cryptocurrency. So most cryptocurrencies have some type of mechanism where in order for you to assert control or ownership of that cryptocurrency, you're going to have some type of secret that goes along with that. That is generally some type of a symmetric or asymmetric key pair as well. So these cryptocurrency wallets, some way of, of storing these uh, secrets is a really important thing to factor in. Some organizations are now accepting cryptocurrency as legitimate payment sources. There are some businesses that are entirely based on the concept of cryptocurrency. Uh, an interesting uh, space that's happening is in the remittance field. Organizations that send money from one country to another in the traditional banking model, that often goes through 15 or 16 different banking intermediaries. So for them, they're, they're looking at using cryptocurrency to transfer funds from one country to another. Well, that now means that their entire financial stake is held in this cryptocurrency wallet as they're metering out their cryptocurrency, uh, whether that's a Bitcoin or, or, or something else. Well, the protection of that wallet is essentially going to be one of the most important secret things that they have. Uh, we, we also see uh, an interesting thing with cryptocurrency wallets. Some of these actually have offline cold storage wallets where the, the key is actually stored in a, um, a, an offline system. Um, and there's some interesting secrets management around how do you keep that uh, password or, or that symmetric key protected for a long period of time. And they actually have these uh, pieces of steel um, that go into a, a, a little physical wallet to protect those keys for a long period of time. So, so there's another type of secret there. Uh, one of the other areas where we see secrets overlooked quite a bit, uh, storage account keys and API tokens. Th these are often assumed to be uh, not in the, the secrets management space, but we most definitely think that there are. When we get to things like storage access keys, we're really kind of thinking about some of the uh, activity about how does a application access a, a storage blob on Azure or AWS. And a lot of that can be facilitated through an automated mechanism with an API key or a storage account key. Well, that is essentially a set of credentials that can be used to access that. So how are we going to go about making sure that those keys are stored properly and only exposed when we want them to? Same thing with API tokens. And, and here's an interesting thing about API tokens. We typically use this so that one web service can talk to another web service and we obscure that information so that only those two services know that, but we're really kind of essentially talking about some type of a symmetric key. How often are these API tokens rolled? How often are these keys updated and changed? Most of them aren't. So by making sure that we keep API tokens inside of our definition of secrets, as we go through defining our mechanisms, we can make sure that we're not overlooking an API token that hasn't changed in 10 years, and we're only focused on passwords and symmetric keys that are uh, sitting inside of our um, SQL servers, for instance. So how do you get a handle on it? Since, since we've kind of defined what these different types of secrets are, how can we go about getting a, a handle on it? And, and here's the, the, the first place you need to start. You need to, find some way of inventorying what these secrets are. We need to know where they are, what systems are using some type of a key. And this is always seen as a, a barrier to most organizations. And, and a lot of times from a security perspective, we sit there and say, yes, I, I'd like to do something about a particular area. No, I don't know where this impacts anything. And we have a lot of systems. We have a lot of whatever. 
Well, that, that's the same for every organization. And I can tell you, uh, as the old adage goes, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And, and it's the same thing here. You, you may have a lot of systems and sitting down and saying, how am I going to inventory all of those may seem like a very big burden. But one of the things that you can do is really start off by figuring out what systems do you know? So if you're a network administrator, if you're uh, in cybersecurity, if you're the CISO, what systems do you see? What, what do you know? What do you interact with? And start there. And, and like anything, kind of germinates from there. That if you're able to, say, identify two or three systems that you touch today, that's at least something. It's a start. So we have to start with at least figuring out where do we think that we're going to have some type of a secret, something using an API token, something that has a password, something that has a symmetric key, those types of systems. And, and maybe you don't even necessarily know if they have a secret, but let's at least figure out what those systems are. The other thing we need to do is we need to make sure that this is a centralized approach. If we're going to have individual business units do this, individual task teams do this, we're not necessarily going to wind up with a very cohesive approach. So the best thing that we can do is at least centralize the effort. There's nothing wrong with delegating to other teams, reaching out to departments, telling them that we're trying to inventory and track these secrets and what the, the end goals are. But we at least need to have a primary mechanism to drive this from a central perspective. The other thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that we're going to be able to control the access. If we're going to go through this process of inventorying and identifying where these secrets are, we're going to need some mechanism eventually to control access to these secrets. Meaning if I go through and, and perform a set of inventory about what secrets we have, if we want to implement some type of control or mechanism, we need to make sure that someone can't circumvent that. If we're going to, for instance, centrally manage certain types of API tokens, we don't want somebody to be able to view that API token or access that without going through that central control process. We, we have to control a secret if we really want to have some way of managing it. We also need to make sure that we have some mechanism to control the permissions individually for users or computers or applications. We need to see what types of mechanisms we have in order to control their access. And here we're really looking for, do we want to look at potentially things that are escrowing secrets, whether it's a administrator who will have to go through, say something like a cyber arc to, to get escrowed access to a password, or maybe that's how we're also tracking our API tokens. We're also going to need something that is going to allow us to, to log the use of a secret. So if we're centralizing and we're controlling a secret, if we're controlling access to who has that secret, we also need to be able to log it so that we can detect if someone's using it inappropriately, if it's being pulled into the wrong place, if it hasn't been rotated frequently enough, it will give us the ability to have trending information, which is something you don't really have now because when a secret such as a password or a symmetric key is out on disparate systems, you don't really know when it is used. So you don't really know what normal patterns are. So the nice thing about this centralized approach is if your secrets are managed in a central place, we can say, wow, that, that's odd. This API token was just checked out 500 times today and normally it only goes out 10 times. So that kind of visibility is integral to making sure that your secrets aren't being used for the wrong the other thing is thinking about what is going to be our plan if something does go wrong. So if we see inappropriate log, um, inappropriate activity in our log, if we have a suspicion of a breach on our network, we need to be thinking about how are we going to plan to manage our secrets during that point? Are all secrets rolled? Are they somehow expired? What systems get priority responses when there's an incident? By having all of this together, we now have the ability to affect those secrets if something happens to our network. Well, we need to have a plan. What, what are we going to do if we suspect that certain systems or maybe the entire network has had some type of a breach? What types of systems need to be updated? So let's start with where are these secrets going to be? If we're talking about an inventorying system, where can you look? Where can you figure these things out? Well, in, in the modern day, we're really going to have secrets all over the place. It's, it's not just something you could walk into your data center in the old world of, of on-premises only and walk down the aisles and say, okay, that server's got something, this server's got something. It's not just on-prem anymore. We, we've got secrets scattered 
everywhere. We have secrets that are associated with our cloud services and cloud providers. So if you're using storage blobs or app services, there's often API tokens or account credentials that access those cloud providers. You could potentially even just start your inventory by saying, okay, we work with Azure, we work with AWS. And you can always drill down further to see if there's API tokens or, or further credentials, but at least identify those cloud services that you're working with. Also think that cloud isn't just those major providers. It's also potentially that, that outsourced HR program that's being used or that outsourced database provider that's uh, doing market outreach. So all of these cloud services have something where they are transmitting or storing information that should be in part of your inventory system so that you can understand how that data and how those secrets are being managed. We also have things like clients. So when we think about um, our, our, our typical client infrastructure, it's not just physical computer sitting at a employee's desk, it's mobile devices, it's tablets, it's um, um, phone devices. Now we even have things like non-persistent desktops. So how are those types of secrets managed in there? Are there things that we need to be worried about? And lastly, the one that we always fear is, is that the stuff that's stuck in no code, uh, whether it's an API token or a password or something, stuff that is stuck in code is just god awful difficult to find. Um, and it, it's, it's not going to be a great story, but maybe there are some things that you already know. Maybe there are those certain things that are stuck out there that somebody has already told you is, well, we, we've got this this thing here, or we've got this script that uses this uh, storage access token to, to, to do some type of a process. So we want to definitely include those things. If you have source code repositories, if those things are being developed in house, like GitHub is, is storing those things, there may be some things that you could do to even just search through the source codes to, to try to track that down. The, the other thing is really kind of thinking about what are some of those dependencies. You, you, you could certainly have an application that you have visibility of, say a, a web server, but there may be a lot of dependencies behind the scenes. It, it may be pulling information from a cloud provider, an on-premise database, and, and other information that a lot of times we kind of have to pierce the veil and look beyond that to see where are other types of secrets and information being stored. Now, here is the, 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 the great thing that we can sit down and say, here's the perfect thing that you should do in your environment. Um, and, and this is easier said than done. I'll, I'll give you that. But I think that this is a, a great philosophy as an organization to, to really sit down is figure out what is your goal before you really start figuring out, can we manage all these secrets? What do we want to do? is figure out at what level. You have to, as an organization, be pragmatic. You can't just implement some security or some feature simply because it makes you, quote unquote, more secure. You can make things so secure that your business can't function. You could tighten every nut and bolt and close every port on your firewall, but if your business can't work, what's, what's the point? So here, we really need to figure out how secure do we want things to be and, and what's the complexity that's going to go along with that. And you really have to find your spot on that roadmap to say, we need something that's robust and secure enough for us, but the complexity of implementing it and using it long term can't exceed the value to the organization. And, and this is one place where, frankly, an organization could say, you know what, we're okay with all of these risks. And, and, and maybe that's your organization. We understand the risk of having these passwords and these secrets out there. But for our business, we have no choice. We, we have to go with that. Maybe the only secret you have is embedded in a piece of source code. And that's the only way your business exists. And it can't change. I, I've actually worked with one customer who had outsourced their entire production um, software for their factory to a third party. And that third party lost the source code. Their factory today still runs on that. They know that there's codes in there. They can't change anything. The cost to redevelop that is exceeding the value of what they think would happen if anything ever happened to that code. As a business, at least they were aware of that. They at least said, for us, the complexity of going through and changing this is not worth the security benefit. So as an organization, make sure you're, you're, you're trying to dial in how much control do you want and what really is going to be the impact on the organization. 
once you've done that, I am really a fan of this carrot or a stick approach to, to, to vendors because we find the same thing with vendors. If you sit there and say, I want your product to do X or why haven't you implemented this new crypto or why don't you support this other thing? Well, you can really look at your relationship with vendors, whether it's a cloud provider or an application provider or a database provider, really doesn't matter, and say you're either a victim or a leader. And what I mean by that is who's going to dictate your security in your organization? Are you going to be dictated by the vendor and what they support? Or will you define those security requirements that are important to your organization? So when we talk about secrets management, the ability to control API tokens or change uh, 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 keys or passwords, anything where, where you want to define certain types of controls, you can either say, well, those products don't support it, so I guess we can't do it. Or you can say, these are important to us. And we're going to give our vendors a goal. We're going to give them the carrot. We want to drive them. So what I mean by this carrot or a stick is are your secrets management goals going to be defined by the vendors or by you? If you allow it to be defined by your vendors, then you have to work within what they give you, what they support, what they don't support. If they don't have something that, that works for your needs, you can look for another product. But otherwise, you can say it would be nice if we could change this symmetric key, but the vendor doesn't allow it. So I guess there's nothing we can do. So at that point, you're really a, a victim of, of your vendors, as opposed to as an organization saying, this is what's important to us. We want certain types of secrets management. We want to be able to centrally manage symmetric keys. We want API tokens to change on a regular basis. Define what that is. Give yourself a roadmap. Figure out what the base baseline is for today, what must exist for a system to be used in your organization today, and then set yourself a goal for two, three, four, five years down the road and say, perhaps in, in two years, we expect certain capabilities. Anything that is using a symmetric key must be able to do symmetric key management and rolling of symmetric keys. In five years, we expect anything that is using, say, API tokens or storage access keys must have some mechanism to automatically roll them and they have to be incorporated. So, so now you have a goal. You're, you're not saying that you're going to implement today, but you have a goal. Then go to your vendors, the ones that you work with today, and you say, here is what it's going to take to continue to work with us. Our goal is in two years is we're going to support this. If you are affected by this, we need you to put this in your roadmap for two years from now. If they say no, then you know that you can go find another vendor to try to meet that need in two years from now. But most vendors are going to say, oh, yeah, you, your business is important to us. Let's see what we can do. Now, if we all sat there, if we all started talking to the same vendors and we all started asking for the same thing, they would go, wow, we're getting a lot of people asking us to do this. The odds of that happening are much greater. So I'm not saying going to a vendor is automatically going to change their mind. But if you don't do it, they're certainly not going to do it unless they're forced to do it. The other thing is by having that roadmap is make sure that your RFPs and other types of systems where you're going out and buying new stuff today, at least make sure that they're asking questions that relate to your roadmap. What, what good is it to say we've got a five-year roadmap of where we want to be from a cryptographic or a secret management perspective, and somebody goes out and buys a new HR system today that's going to be around for 20 years and doesn't support any of that stuff? So it'd be great to make sure that once you define what these things are going to be, we want symmetric keys to be rolled, no, no passwords, you must do multi-factor authentication, whatever those things are, make sure that they're part of that RFP process that your organization does today. So it's at least part of the scoring criteria. The other side, we need to think a little bit about what are the levels of security? There's different ways of going about this secrets management. If, if we've inventoried what they've had, if we're able to identify what these are, we can really look at different ways of limiting the security. And it really kind of goes back to the complexity. So one of the easiest things that we can do is limit access to secrets. So, so here we're talking about how do we make sure that someone can't misappropriate a secret? How can we make sure that they're stored securely, that organizations have reasonable controls over them without a massive change to the infrastructure? Well, here we're really just talking about limiting access, using things like password vaults, you know, a cyber arc or LastPass, something where we're at least making sure that those secrets aren't sitting in text files, they're not sitting inside of someone's email, they're sitting in some type of a vaulted system. 
We also have things like hardware security modules where we're controlling access to private keys or even Git repositories where source code with, with embedded API tokens, for instance, are securely accessed. So we're limiting access to the public. We're having some type of a control around it. We're not drastically changing systems. The other side is really looking at the next level. But what can we do to increase the, the level of security from there. Now we can start talking about encrypting the secrets. We're making sure that uh, secrets like API tokens and passwords and other information is encrypted and stored so that it's not readily accessible. And here we're really kind of getting to a point of how do we make sure that somebody can't just come along and, and pick up a copy of our LastPass password vault, for instance, or, or pick up some other type of information. So we want to make sure that the, the secrets themselves are securely kept, not just in a central location. So that the concept of security through obscurity isn't acceptable. We can't just say, well, this thing's hidden away. We really need to make sure it's protected. And lastly, we can really implement a strong management of, of uh, secrets around using systems that control access. You now, symmetric key management systems, escrowing services, where a administrator isn't just going into a password vault and, and copying a password. With an escrow service, if somebody needs to for instance, log in as a enterprise administrator, they go through an escrow service and they say, I'd like to have this credential. That system logs them in. They never see the password. They never have access to the password. It's logged. It can even have a, a secondary approver. It has a much more complicated implementation, but it may affer, uh, uh, um, afford greater controls for certain types of organizations. So what happens if you decide not to do something with your secrets? What And maybe these are some of the challenges that, that we see today. We certainly see a large number of organizations reporting information leaks, network compromise, data breaches. All of these things ultimately go back to poor secrets management. If we're talking about a hotel chain where their, their customer information was left out on a storage blob for anyone to come along, that's most definitely a, a, a epitome of poor secrets management. That stuff never should have been exposed. It should have been encrypted and encryption information kept somewhere else. We, we, we see uh, impact from a loss of, uh, of reputation. Um, a lot of these large organizations have most definitely suffered some type of PR issue from this information being released. We've even seen businesses shut down or forced to be sold. Uh, this is essentially some, some of the things that we see in the public CA space. If you can't manage secrets and, and your job is all about secrets or identities, then you're going to be forced out of business. So this isn't something we can just ignore. So a couple of final notes to, to wrap up on. We need to make sure that we centralize our approach. We, we need to have some way of taking these secrets once we've identified them and once we know where they are. We need to store them in a central place. We need to control access to them. We need to make sure that our data is kept separate from our secrets and keys. We, we don't want to do things like encrypting information and then leaving our keys right next to that data. We want to make sure that we're controlling access to those keys, to those secrets. We also want to make sure that any kind of data that we have is encrypted at rest, in processing. There's even some really interesting stuff happening in the database space where all the database processing happens while the data is still encrypted, even on the server itself. So wherever we can keep things encrypted, don't assume that that one temporary place where information is being stored temporarily unencrypted is going to be safe. It should always be encrypted. We also need to make sure that we're thinking about administrative versus technology. There, there are certain things that we can say from policies. No, password should not be written down. Password shouldn't be uh, uh, stored or um, the use of, of weak passwords. Policies aren't enough. No, humans will always find the easiest, weakest way to do something. And it's not necessarily a benevolent thing. Uh, it, it, it's simply human nature. It's, it's like, I'm gonna take the path of least resistance. We wanna make sure that um, anything that we are doing from a key management perspective, from a symmetric key management perspective, is going to be audited and verified. We want to trust but verify. Just because the system says it's rolling keys, just because it says it's controlling access, uh, access to an API token, for instance, make sure somebody's actually checking those things. Make sure that we're watching those for compliance. Make Make sure that if we do see that keys aren't being rolled, if passwords are being checked out too frequently, that something's being done to remediate that. 
And then we also need to be thinking about um, that centralized repository. If, if we're going to bring all of those secrets into one place, uh, you know, the, the great thing about uh, one central place is we can put lots of controls around it. We, we know where those secrets are. We know where those keys are. We know where those passwords are. But guess who else is going to be interested? Those adversaries, somebody who wants to do something wrong is also going to see that as a great spot to go. So we really want to make sure that we're not being um, short-sighted and failing to think about who could potentially get around some of those security controls. So what are some of the things that you could implement today to help with secrets management? There's certainly things like public key infrastructure where we can move away from passwords. That is a, a type of secret out there. And now we're really working with private keys and there are options to, to manage those private keys, whether they're TPM chips, there's uh, smart cards, there's hardware security modules. There's definitely mechanisms within PKI to control some of those secrets. There's passwording uh, vaults, whether it's a, as simple as a LastPass type of a, a, a software-based perspective or the complexity of a cyber arc. There's a lot of vaulting technologies that are available out there today to help you centralize and manage these secrets. On the symmetric side, we also have key management systems like FutureX, Formetric, and, and Cryptomatic that provide a centralized mechanism to be able to store, change, audit, and control access to things like symmetric keys. Database technologies like SQL Server have TDE and always encrypted to make sure that data is being encrypted. It's up to you to make sure that the keys that Microsoft uh, SQL Server uses is somehow escrowed or rotated, but there is data at rest, data during processing um, capabilities there. And obviously, uh, cloud providers have things like Azure Key Vault, AWS has HSM services as well. So there are technologies available for you. So it's not just a matter of, of some ephemeral idea of, hey, let's go out, do all the secret management. Now what am I going to do? Th there are solutions that are out there that can be mapped to it. So I think we've gotten a couple questions that have been sent over. Um, the first question I see here is, uh, how do you ensure that the third party vendor is adequately managing secrets? Um, in, in short, you don't. Um, when, when we're dealing with third parties and, and cloud providers, the, the best that we can really do is have a conversation with them. Uh, if they have some type of independent audit or uh, review that is done, that there may be some reporting uh, from a trusted uh, source that you could use as well. Uh, but if there's not really the best that you could do is have a conversation with them around what you're trying to achieve and, and find out um, what they are doing. Um, and, and if you need proof, maybe they can provide you with some of that proof. Another question here is, uh, how do you eliminate hard-coded and default passwords? Um, th there probably isn't a way to, to eliminate default passwords. Almost everything comes today uh, with some type of a default password. I, I, I am often impressed with the systems and, and applications that come with a, a setup process that have you set a default password, that they're, they're not in an operational state. Uh, and it actually reminds me of the early days of, of Windows that Microsoft used to, to ship their servers that when you installed it, uh, it actually didn't open itself up to the network until you clicked a button that said, yes, I'm ready to go on the network. Uh, what was nice about that is it didn't automatically assume that whatever the default security was going to be sufficient for the environment. So when it comes to default passwords, uh, the one good thing is a, as a business is uh, you usually have a fairly good idea of what systems you're bringing into the environment, uh, especially if you're standardizing on certain hardware or certain applications or, or cloud services, you may be able to identify which of those have some type of default password. And sometimes the manufacturers will, will even work with you to change those things. So I know Dell is uh, pretty um, active in the space of working with, with companies that, that buy volume and helping to have certain things set up ahead of time. So you might even be able to change some of those things. Uh, the hard-coded, 
um, it, it, it hard coded passwords is, is, is hard. Um, it, it happens for a reason. It can be hidden away. It gets buried in code. No one ever knows it's there. Um, so it's not great. But one of the things that you can do is by having uh, source code repositories like GitHub or something else like that is it makes it a little bit easier to do um, uh, research um, on the source code that you have, at least the stuff that you're writing in house to look for that kind of stuff. Great. Here's another question, uh, Mark. So what are your thoughts on leveraging BYOK, bring your own key? as a root of trust for third party of public cloud provider key management solutions? So I, I, I'm a big fan of, of BYOK and then uh, we're actually trying to term a, a new one called hold your own key. Uh, but BYOK is, is, is an interesting phenomenon. So this one is uh, for instance, um, creating your, your own public and private key pair, perhaps inside of a, a hardware security module and then uh, providing it to a cloud provider um, in, in a secure way. The the intent is if anything happens at that cloud space or I want to move my workload, I, I still have my key. I, I still have the ability to move it around. Um, one of the things you need to, to keep in mind though is just because you, you brought your own key doesn't really mean that you have any way of affecting the security and control of that key once it's at the, the cloud provider. Now, if you're using something like the Azure BYOK, you, you know that you created a key inside of a, a hardware security module. It was uploaded inside of a hardware security module. So, so that's pretty straightforward. But the access and the use and the, the auditability of that key inside of the, the cloud provider is, is still very obtuse. It, it, it's, it's not very transparent to the end user. Uh, but you do have the ability to say, you know what, we're not going to do business with you anymore. I'm going to take my copy of the key and put it into another cloud provider. You, I really look at BYOK as who owns the key, not necessarily who can control the key. Because just because you got it in your HSM, for instance, you can't somehow magically make those bits disappear uh, out of Azure if they don't comply. Okay, thank you. Here's another question. Should we define a trust store as a secret? If we're talking about things like certificate trust stores, then then um, I, I would say I haven't traditionally thought of that as a secret in, in that uh, a trust store really kind of goes back to what types of secrets are we going to, to potentially trust? It's, it's not a secret itself. Um, but that being said, I, I think there are potentially some advantages to um, um, controlling the trust stores of, of um, not just individual certificates, but trusted routes. We, we certainly see um, uh, management of this space when it comes to the, the browsers from Microsoft and, and Apple, for instance, Mozilla. They, they trust this as essentially as a set of secrets and, and what you're going to trust. Um, and there's certainly ways of circumventing protections if that trust store is somehow uh, circumvented. So you certainly could classify and say there are certain threats that we have that we're concerned about in our organization, and we're going to essentially manage that trust. And, and Microsoft even provides a mechanism where you can control what that trust list is going to be in your organization. So that, that certainly could be classified depending on your, your threat profile. Okay, thanks. I think we should wrap up with maybe one more question. So here's one. What, which, what are the best practices you would recommend for storing secrets securely on the CI/CD process? Um, I, I don't know if I have a, a specific answer there. Uh, my, my, my general answer when it comes to passwords is, is one, Avoid them whenever possible. Uh, if, if, if passwords must be used, and, and this is a, um, a, a personal preference here, if, if we're going to use passwords, I'd much rather there be some type of secondary factor. So multi-factor authentication, we talk about quite a bit. Um, you know, I really look at passwords as, uh, regardless of how securely I keep them, it's still guessable. It's still hackable. It, it's simply a piece of information I know that somebody else could guess or steal or figure out. So regardless of how secure I do that, I, I could take a password and lock it in the best vault in the world. Um, but if somebody guesses it, it doesn't matter that it's in my vault. So, so passwords and, and, and um, securely keeping them really should be seen as one 
uh, step to the authentication process. So uh, yes, use password vaulting systems. Yes, use some type of control around it. Yes, make them complex. Don't make it easy. But I would not see that as the end of the story. I, I would classify any kind of password best practice as something that includes a multi-factor or some other type of secret that I can physically control or otherwise uh, ensure is used that just can't be guessed like a password. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you all for joining us today. If you have more questions, surely just send them over to the PKI guy at pkisolutions.com. And again, this is this uh, episode two of 12 uh, webinars that we have um, ongoing. So check back at pkisolutions.com slash webinars for more information on upcoming and past webinars. Thanks again and stay well.